So I was told to give a basic scientist perspective. I'm actually a clinician scientist myself, not a basic scientist, and I do collaborate with basic scientists and do translational research. And so I was able to review the literature for you and show you some of the work we've done. Um, is this, this one goes forward? Which one? Okay, so um, some of the work that I'm showing you were funded uh, by various institutes in the past, and I actually wasn't funded specifically to look at the interaction between HIV and, and marijuana use or cannabis use, but it, as you see, because it's so prevalent that you just cannot even get away from it because many of our HIV patients use marijuana, so I was able to you know, pass out some of the findings. Um, so marijuana, as you already heard from Tom, it's, it's, um, it's really prevalent and according to the uh, World Drug Report, um, the, you know, worldwide is like 100 and anywhere between 125 to 227 million people use marijuana. And so compared, if you, you can see, is this the, uh, is this the uh, pointer? Is there a pointer for this? this thing? Oh, anyway, so you, let me go back. So you can see that the cannabis use is much, much more common and prevalent compared to other drugs, right? Amphetamine, ecstasy, opioid, and cocaine. Um, so worldwide, it's estimated about 180 million people are using it. And in the U.S. alone, 40, the latest reports show 43.5 five million people, that's 15% of the U.S. population have used the drug, you know, within the past year. And the people, but those are not the people that are using every day. People that are using every day is still eight million people. And that's almost double over the past decade. And this is partly maybe related to the legalized marijuana that's really the fastest growing industry in the U.S. Um, uh, a few years ago, there were data showing when, when it was first becoming legalized in the first six days that, um, you know, the, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, the most rapidly growing industry, and a lot of kids 12 years and older are using it. Um, worldwide, this is very interesting because, like, it's, you already saw, even with the DEA schedule, um, Tom was describing how within the DEA scheduling, there's so many different types of scheduling, so the legality is very complicated. But worldwide, you can see the blue areas are the ones that uh, mostly all of Canada, Western United States, some parts of South America is pretty much legal, essentially legal. But the red areas, Asia and you know, Europe and some other places are really not legal. Like in India, that's pink. They said legal but not enforced. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really very monitor and, and enforced very differently throughout the world. Oh, hmm. Okay, let me see. And what about marijuana use in HIV patients? And you can see the solid bars are the persons with HIV who are using marijuana or cannabis and then the hash bars of the general population. So relative to the general population, you can see that um, marijuana use is much, much more prevalent, um, as, as is also the case for crack cocaine and amphetamine. Um, opioid is actually not that much more compared to the general population, according to this one study here. And from the charter study, um, that's actually their center, they found that 25% of HIV in, in the positive individuals report they've used marijuana in their lifetime. Based on my personal experience, maybe because I worked in Hawaii before, I think it's much higher than that. I think it's more like 50%, and not everyone's willing to admit it if you live in a state that's considered illegal for using it. Although medicinal marijuana uh, is legal in many states, and so most HIV patients use marijuana medicinally because it's now you heard it's legal now in 33 states, that number keeps on going up. And now with legalization of recreational marijuana use in many more states, that's gonna to continue to increase um, usage in uh, HIV patients. And this, uh, one of the most recent uh, data showing, you can see how between 2014 and 2018, the prevalence of 
like the earlier charter study said 25% and now it's up to 27% of HIV patients are using marijuana for medical purposes versus 17% of general population. So marijuana is the most commonly used substance in persons living with HIV. And marijuana, you already heard, it's more than just <clears throat> THC, right? It's not just THC. And short, in the short term, when somebody smokes, there's a lot of um, immediate effects that you heard about. It can affect, you know, cause sensory distortion, panic, anxiety. It affects the motor coordination. <clears throat> it can slow the reaction time and lower the accuracy of their performance on whatever task they're doing. Um, the initial high is followed by sleepiness and increased heartbeat. And so, but long term, there's actually been reports showing, um, uh, you know, both positive and negative effects. So some thought it might reduce resistance to infection, like because it is an immunosuppressant, um, suppressed immune system, it can affect growth, it can uh, lead to abnormal structured cells, reduction of male sex hormones, and rapid destruction of lung fibers. So there are some harmful effects in the long term. And behaviorally, what about in the brain? And I'm trained as a neurologist, so I, most of my work focused on the brain. So um, that's been shown acutely. It can lead to deficits in learning and memory. It can cause apathy, drowsiness, lack of motivation. Um, personality and mood changes and inability to un understand things clearly. So now <clears throat> with HIV infection in the brain, um, I just want to first focus on HIV. So the virus, the little uh, red stars of the HIV virus, they um, infect the peripheral monocytes. This is a cross section of blood vessel. Um, so once it gets into the blood vessel, infects the monocyte, the, monocyte macrophages carry the virus across the blood-brain barrier into the brain. And once it's in the brain, it releases all kinds of chemokines and cytokines. And let's see, laser pointer. OK, good. So it releases all this uh, chemokines and cytokines. And they, in turn, can lead to damage to the neurons. And the neurons that release glutamate, they're normally taken back up by the astrocytes. And, and once the astrocytes are inflamed or activated, they cannot reuptake the glutamate, and therefore that could lead to excitotoxicity and further apoptosis. And let's see. So neuronal injury can occur due to the virus either directly from the toxic protein of um, GP120 or the you know, viral protein, or it can be caused indirectly due to the uh, cytokines and chemokines. And it can, you know, the neuroinflammation. And then also because it can, the inflammation can also increase blood-brain barrier perme permeability, allowing more infected monocytes that carry the virus into the brain. So those are the, like the three main ways of um, the virus affecting the brain. And so you heard about this. And so it turns out that the reason marijuana works in our brain is because there is an endogenous uh, system called endocannabinoid system that actually have cannabinoid receptors so that the, when somebody smokes marijuana or use marijuana compounds, it can actually bind to these receptors. And those receptors have um, kind of endogenous, uh, they're kind of like neurotransmitters, except they're lipid form. And, and it's thought that this system is, you've already heard quite a bit from Tom how it can affect many, many systems. but Here's a list of all the uh, functions that the endocannabinoid system has been linked to, affecting memory and appetite, stress, immune system, and energesia, and sleep, and even physical exercise. Some people thought, like, you know, the runner's high that you get is because there's release of um, endocannabinoids as well. And so, getting back to that diagram that I show you about how the virus gets into the brain. So how does en endocannabinoids and CB1, CB2 receptor agonists affect the brains of HIV in, uh, infection? So first of all, the endocannabinoids can actually stimulate anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-4 and IL-10. Therefore, it can maybe counteract some of the, some of the um, cytokines and chemokines, and it could protect the neurons that way at least it's theoretically. 
and also and, and from basic science studies. And it can also um, inhibit TNF-alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, IL-1 and IL-6. So by you know, stimulating the anti-inflammatory cytokine and inhibiting the inflammatory cytokines, it can actually help counteract the brain inflammation in the brain. So you would think that would be a good thing. And also, the CB1, CB2 agonists have been shown to restore blood-brain barrier permeability, so it can prevent the virus from getting in. So, so there are actually, theoretically, um, it could be protective for the brain, and that's this is a data that we derive from basic science research. And so I reviewed the literature in the basic science studies. In the cell culture study, people you know, use like glioma cells, for example, and show that the CB1, if you put CB1 agonists that stimulate the CB1 receptor, it can actually prevent HIV, TET, and pro-inflammatory uh, interferon gamma-mediated overproduction of nitric oxide. And in also other, you know, murine uh, neuronal cultures, treating, and treating it with endocannabinoid also prevents the excess intracellular calcium and prevent neuronal cell death. And also, there's, um, they can also affect the, the phi inhibition, which is the um, enzyme that's needed to synthesize the endocannabinoid on demand, just like what uh, Tom was talking about. We can act, uh, that can actually, by inhibiting that, and if you don't have that uh, endocannabinoid, then that can lead to more cell death, which means that um, you know, th this is actually a way of demonstrating that it's um, this, this, this may be one way of, uh, you know, treating uh, the, the neuronal toxicity by, um, af by affecting this enzyme. And the other enzyme that's used to break down the endocannabinoid, uh, by inhibiting that, that leads to less TAT-mediated hippocampal neuronal loss. So altogether from cell culture study, we see that endocannabinoids, if you increase the release of endocannabinoid either directly or indirectly through the inhibitors, you can ameliorate neuronal toxicity and ultimately prevent HIV-mediated neuronal cell damage. At least that's what those early studies in the, um, and what the cell culture studies showing us. And what about rodent studies? From rat studies, um, four of the studies here in different rodent models, either, you know, um, mice that are transgenic with the um, GP120 or rats and so forth, all of this study basically show that by increasing the endocannabinoids in the, in the brain, it can lead to neuroprotection. There was only one study um, that this came from UCLA by Michael Roth's group, where they showed that if they gave um, THC, which is the major ingredient in um, a cannabis, that can lead to increased viral load, upregulated CCL5 expression, and only acutely, because they had a chronic model and that didn't happen during the chronic situation. And THC and HIV both suppress interferon gamma producing cells. So this is really the only study that possibly shows some harmful acute effect. But overall, I think the rodent study also points to the fact that CB1 receptor activation or far inhibition both lead to increased endocannabinoids can show anti-inflammatory effects in the rodent model. But THC might be different because you heard that THC is more than, I mean, when somebody use marijuana, <clears throat> it's, more than, it's more than just THC, right? So what about the monkey model? So there were actually several studies done using the SIV model because then it's closer to the human condition with primates. Um, the first study here showed that there's upregulation of CB2 receptor in the microglia nodules and far overexpression in cortical white matter, no effect on CB1 receptor. So altogether, this, this first study actually did show that there may be negative influence on the endocannabinoid because there was <clears throat> increased cannabinoid that lead to more um, um, microglia nodules, which could mean there could be more inflammation. Um, and maybe allowing more viral entry, but at the same time, microglia is, or has a protective role as well. So the interpretation of this finding is a little bit um, unclear to me, and 
the next study showed that THC pretreatment of uh, an SIV model led to dose-dependent slowing. So that's sort of like the acute effect, right? Just like humans, when they take marijuana, they, they, they can have acute memory impairment and so forth. So here, in the short term, they make more mistakes on the cognitive tasks, but with chronic administration, and especially one year later, this is now getting closer to the human condition, because you can't do that in a cell culture study or animal study, but in the SIV model, they can actually give chronic administration up to one year. And even one year is still a lot less than what humans do, but still, it's, it's just getting closer. They can develop tolerance to behavioral effects and no change in disease markers with the viral load and CD4. So, so it seems like the, the body has a way of adjust or develop tolerance to the effects of THC. So chronic marijuana use may not have negative behavioral effects. That's the conclusion from this study. And the third study showed that THC before and after SIV infection led to slower progression of SIV and decreased neuroinflammation because it is an immunosuppressant. So overall, I think THC appears to have neuroprotective effect in SIV model, and chronic THC could lead to tolerance of behavioral effects. So I've now summarized for you what the cell culture studies have shown, what the rodent study have shown, and what the SIV study, and they all kind of has sort of a positive spin to um, the findings. So what about humans? <laughs> Does marijuana use further affect brain function in HIV patients? So this is a review paper done by Chris, uh, Christina Meats group. Um, they show that uh, the impact of marijuana use, um, the most robust effect, and that's actually, it was reviewed by Igor Gren and their team also before in the past, show it, they did have some meta-analysis paper showing that acutely marijuana can affect memory function, lead to acute memory deficits, but chronically, the effect is very different. Um, uh, it, people seem to adjust to it or develop tolerance to it, similar to what you see in the monkeys. And there were 23 studies in HIV patients showing medium to large effects on memory from HIV by itself, and also marijuana use, uh, only with the heavy and acute use. And even, even the findings across those studies were a little bit mixed. And in this review paper, they only, actually only had two papers that talked about the combined effect of HIV and marijuana use, showing both additive uh, and independent effect on complex motor tasks. And, and I will show you some of the study we did uh, looking at the brain metabolites. So again, going back to this diagram that I show you about how the virus gets into the brain, so it just happens that, well, I've been using brain imaging technique to study how the brain is affected by HIV patients for a long time. And in, in the brain, we, we can evaluate neuronal injury using a variety of imaging techniques that I list here, structural MRI, MRS, PET, and fMRI. And we can also evaluate neuroinflammation using MRS to measure various chemicals that are reflective of neuroinflammation using diffusion tensor imaging, or now there's some newer PET ligands. And we can also assess blood-brain barrier permeability. So I'm going to show you the rest of the talk, some of the imaging studies that we've done. Um, so in contrast to acute marijuana effects or acute um, effects of THC, humans uh, that use marijuana, they typically use it, use it for years, right? They start using marijuana when they are in their adolescence and they continue to use them. And many of them actually get to use marijuana before they develop, um, before they develop uh, HIV. So um, on structural imaging, there were no, no changes reported from head CT scan. On structural MRI, the data is all over the place. One study showed no change on the gray matter, white matter, CSF, and the other ones show increase or decrease gray matter density, and one show increased gray matter density. And it turns out the age of first use also affect some of this measurement. So the brain structural changes are really unclear, but um, there's only one study that actually looked at the combined effects of HIV and marijuana use. This is a study done by April Thomas at UCLA. So she did a two-by-two two design of you know, individuals with and without marijuana use or with and without HIV, and um, did a brief cognitive battery, and they found that individuals who 
who, who use marijuana have higher, uh, the higher the marijuana use, they show smaller enterino cortex and fusiform gyrus. So the sample size is still small in this, stu in this study, so maybe that's true, maybe it's due to something else. And HIV patients have thinner cingulate cortex, and that's reported from other HIV studies in the past. And they did see a little bit of interaction effect, and they show that individuals who use like fairly low dose, 1.4 grams per week, um, they did a little bit worse if they had HIV, but, and they were using marijuana. But, so there's only, um, so in the seronegative control, if they use a little bit marijuana, they did better on the cognitive function, but it doesn't uh, demonstrate that HIV use increased the risk for con worse cognition, at least from this one study. And our lab used a slightly different technique that look at microstructural changes, which is a way of look, tracking the Brownian motion of water molecules across uh, different fiber tracks. And we can measure water diffusing either radially, you know, perpendicular to the axon, or along the axon. So the radial diffusion gives us an, an idea what the myelination the myelination status and the um, <clears throat> axial diffusion tracks water along the axon. So if there's axonal damage, we can see abnormalities there. So we also did a two by two design uh, looking at individuals with and without marijuana use and with and without HIV. We carefully selected them and the marijuana use had to have used marijuana chronically at least three times a week for at least two years. And on average, they were actually using marijuana for more than 10 years. And um, we excluded all the potential confounds. And we measure like eight different major cerebral white matter tracts and five subcortical regions, measuring those uh, axial and radial diffusion as well as fractional anisotropy, which is also giving us idea about how coherent the fibers are, the integrity of fibers. So, what we found is that regardless of marijuana use, HIV patients show this lower fractional anisotropy. So the red bars of the HIV patients with, without marijuana use and with marijuana use are the solid bars. And the blue bars are the control. So you can see that in all the spring regions, the HIV patients have lower fractional anisotropy, which indicates less coherent fibers in these fiber tracts. And we also look at axial diffusion, and they seem to have slightly higher axial diffusion, suggesting axonal damage in those few regions that we looked at. And that's also, con all that actually is consistent with prior report. And also, regardless of marijuana use, the radial diffusivity is increased, and, and they're, they're really not significantly different between whether HIV patients use marijuana or not in these regions and again, suggesting lesser myelination in this region. So from previous study, it seems that the radio diffusion is affected later state when HIV, effect, when patients with hand, like people who have more severe forms of um, brain involvement, uh, that's when the radio diffusion is affected. So, so far, we only see HIV effect. We don't really see additional marijuana effects. The only brain region where we saw an interaction is in the globus pallidus, where marijuana users actually have lower um, radio diffusion and mean diffusion, uh, they, they were not affected, but the HIV marijuana users have higher diffusion. So it suggests that marijuana use might have anti-inflammatory effect only in the seronegative control subject, but sort of a pro-inflammatory effect in the HIV subjects. So um, we're gonna try to see if we can validate that with some CSF cytokines. So, so far, you know, the effects in humans are not, um, it's not really showing much of an effect from marijuana use and a little bit of interaction effect, but most of the effect we see is still just from HIV. And so <clears throat> some of the earlier study in humans looked at acute effects of marijuana. So there were a lot of, so, so I've shown you like macro and micro structural brain changes so far. So what about brain function? Like there are experiments that look at brain function in marijuana users. So this are looking at just the brain at rest, not doing anything, looking at SPEC, FDG, or, 
uh, oxygen 15 PET studies. Those studies, by and large, show L acutely if you inject THC into a human IV, you will see increased glucose metabolism and increased blood flow. And that correlates with self rating of intoxication. And this is actually a very old study done by Nora Vogel in 1996, where she injected IV THC in chronic marijuana users. Um, and again, uh, there, were, there was increased cerebellar glucose metabolism, increased cerebellar and dos in, in the occasional marijuana users. But in chronic marijuana users, there's more brain regions that show increase. Um, so, so by whether somebody's using it occasionally or using it all the time, uh, the acute effect of THC could be very different in the brain as well. So there are other, other studies that have used O15 that pretty much show the same thing, increase blood flow, and, uh, after, and people have also done it instead of IV THC, they have them smoke a marijuana cigarette, and they can see the same thing. So those are the acute effects, but what about chronic effects? So instead of using PET studies, we can also use functional MRI study, and we can see that uh, on this working memory task, um, we see increased activation in marijuana users when they are performing this task in the MRI scanner, but there are regions where they also have less activation. That shows that the <clears throat> brain network is reorganized. They have to reallocate resources from one region to the next, and, and also shows that the brain actually had to compensate by increasing attentional requirement. And we did another study where, because marijuana is supposed to affect attention, so we specifically evaluated attention by having them track a bunch of moving balls and, and also tracking increasing number of moving balls. And those are the regions involved in the attention network. And the more balls they track, the more they activate this part of the brain. And what we found is that um, compared to um, controls on the top row, the marijuana users, we further separate them into whether they were, had negative urine and they were abstinent from using marijuana versus whether they were acute, you know, had positive urine. So it seems that the two marijuana user groups, um, they both have lower attention and network activation, but so instead of the normal attention network, they actually activate less, but instead they actually have to use the reserve network, which is the regions that when we increase the attentional load, they activate more. So, and on average, these individuals use like 2,000 joints in their lifetime and use more than 12 years. So this is sort of somewhat consistent with what the previous PET studies have shown. And again, it can show that, you know, whether somebody has marijuana on board or not, whether they have positive urine for THC or not, the activation can be very different during the attention task. And Christina's group, actually, Christina Mee's group actually looked, specifically looked at uh, synergistic effects of marijuana and HIV. So they studied a group of HIV patients, and they found that um, uh, they did a different task. This is a task where they have to look at, uh, it's a Stroop task where they actually have to say the opposite of what they see and they really have to pay attention. And what they found is that marijuana users who have HIV, HIV patients who use marijuana, there was synergistic effect where their brain had to work extra hard in order to perform the task. And those are the, actually the same brain regions involved in attention. And this is the last study I want to show you where we look, also look at combining independent effects of chronic marijuana use on brain chemistry, on brain metabolites. Again, it's a two by two design. And this is a different cohort we study from, from New York. And um, this were, again, re regular marijuana users. They, use, they started using when in their late teens and use uh, cumulative um, lifetime use quite a bit. They were abstinent at the, at the time of the study. And they did detailed neuropsychological tests and everybody had proton spectroscopy done on the four Tesla scanner. And on the cognitive performance, we actually, again, saw minimal marijuana effects. We saw strong HIV effect as expected 
and again, no interactive effects on the cognitive performance. And since the, the CB1 receptor that I mentioned to you, they're actually widely distributed throughout the brain. Um, as you heard before, the endocannabinoid is involved in neuromodulation, and it can actually inhibit release of neurotransmitters like GABA and other chemicals as well. So by looking at where those um, cannabinoid receptors are located, it helps us select the brain regions that we want to measure. And we look at the four groups, and we were seeing actually interactive effect on glutamate uh, measurements. And um, there's also both independent and combined effect for this four groups. So HIV marijuana users have higher creatine level, but lower glutamate levels. And so it's thought that lower glut and the um, in the seronegative controls, they actually, uh, the marijuana users, they also have lower, lower uh, myonositol level, this first one, which might, again, point to the less inflammation because myonositol is a gliomarker, so lower levels suggest um, less inflammation. And the lower glutamate in the HIV patient might be associated with poor cognitive function because we actually done another study in HIV patients only and found that um, as you know, HIV patients, especially those with hand, with, with the cognitive impairment, have lower glutamate level, and the lower glutamate level is thought to be due to activated astroglia that cannot reuptake the glutamate, remember? And once they cannot reuptake the glutamate, eventually they deplete this recycling process. They, they cannot replenish the glutamate intracellularly. And the HIV also suppresses synthesis of glutamate in the TCA cycle, and we also know that the some of the NRTIs can be mitochondrial toxic. So those are the th at least three reasons we think why the glutamate is lower. And what's interesting is that the lower the glutamate is, the worse they perform on the neuropsychological test. So HIV subjects, they were um, slower and recall fewer words. It, so here they're slower on the trail. They recall fewer words if they had lower glutamate levels. And they also take longer time to do uh, some of the reaction time tasks. And so we also know that glutamate actually decreases with age. So the solid line is normal aging, and we've shown that uh, with normal aging, the glutamate level goes down. But HIV patients, which are the red dots here in the red line, they start out lower, and they, they don't seem to have a steeper age-related decrease, but they are lower the whole time. So if they are 40, somebody who's 40 years old, it's going to look like levels of somebody who's 50 years old if they're normal. So this is what we call premature aging. So um, there are many, <laughs> since this aging conference, I had to throw in at least one aging slice. Um, so we've, we've shown from many previous studies that HIV patients have either accelerate, they could have legacy effects uh, due to whatever reason that they have lower levels, like smaller volume or higher greater inflammation in the brain or, um, and we just saw this lower glutamate level. So they could have uh, accelerated aging or premature aging already in the brain just due to HIV alone. And on fMRI, we see that, you know, some patients can compensate and remain. So even if they have normal cognitive function, doesn't mean the brain is normal. But if they cannot compensate anymore, that's when they develop hand and they have declined function. So. We already know that HIV can impact aging in the brain. And so even though the preclinical studies showing us that, you know, the cell culture studies were mostly favorable, showing that there's neuroprotective effect from CB1 receptors or CB2 receptor agonist, and the animal model is also mostly favorable too, but those models really do not capture the chronic usage condition that we see in humans. And then even in human study, there were minimal or some beneficial effects, especially in the light users. And we don't see additive effects on brain structure, but we do see more, some synergistic effect on the most sensitive task. So sh we can evaluate how people who are using marijuana actually, even if they appear to be normal cognitively, they actually, the brains are actually compensating and have to work a lot harder in order to perform the task. And we see some interactive effect on brain metabolite as well. So some of the 
uh, more advanced imaging techniques are able to show us how the brain is affected by marijuana use in HIV patients, but our brains are kind of amazing. We can compensate quite a bit, and it's only when you exhaust all your reserve and you can't compensate anymore, then you can develop cognitive deficit. But I'll come back to that point later. There are many method methodological challenges when we compare the studies. They're difficult to compare due to many reasons. The preclinical studies, they use different cell or animal models and use different drug dosages. In the human studies, um, there's variable THC potency. You know, in the old days, I think 10, 20 years ago, marijuana potency was like 10% from the regular marijuana use. And you heard earlier, Tom said, even in the uh, pharmacological trial, they're using up to eight milligram or 8% THC. But now I hear that the dosage potency can go up to like close to 20% and as high as 30%, especially with some of the edibles. So the higher potency could actually lead to toxic effects, I think. So there's acute versus chronic, and whether they're abstinent or not can affect you know, what you see on the measurements. A lot of subject variabilities that we are familiar with, variable ART treatment in the HIV patients, and then a lot of other confounding variables like mental health problems and also co-use of other drugs. Because when we study marijuana users, many of them use alcohol and tobacco and other stimulants much more commonly. And in our imaging studies, we carefully screen out those, some of these potential confounds. But when you're comparing across study, they're not always there. Um, it's difficult to model the chronic marijuana use conditions because individual humans use marijuana for years and they start using them in adolescence, many of them before they start getting, before um, they get the HIV. But then HIV patients, some of them will start using marijuana for medicinal purpose after they use HIV. So, so it is very difficult to model and we do see some neuroprotective effect from the preclinical studies, but, but Again, marijuana has more than just THC, right? And smoking can have negative effects on brain function, which can then affect uh, cardiovascular uh, effects later. And the aging population has less brain reserve, because I was t trying, I think what I've shown you so far is that even if they behaviorally appear to be normal, we can see from the brain imaging study that there are abnormalities, and, and the brains are actually working much harder to compensate so once they, um, uh, as they age and they have less brain reserve, then the cognitive effect, cognitive deficit can appear sooner, I think. So most studies, I think the conclusion I have is that we need a lot more studies in order to evaluate the chronic effects of marijuana use in the aging HIV infected population before recommendation can be made regarding its use in both medicinal and chronic recreational use. So I just want to thank my collaborators and the teams that helped me collect and analyze the data. Thank you.